back everybody for our ongoing virtual seminar series. Uh, hope you're all doing well. Feel free to turn on your video if you like. It's much nicer uh, to see real faces than uh, black squares. Um, so this week's uh, seminar speaker is uh, Professor Norm Murray of the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics, shortened to CETA usually. Uh, Norm is a very versatile theorist. He works in a wide range of areas. Um, many of you who work in extragalactic uh, physics and AGN know him for his work uh, on momentum-driven winds and winds and feedback from, from AGN and galaxies as a whole. Um, but he also has interest in other areas, including planetary systems. Um, and I'm wondering whether that is what the, uh, was the motivation or the trigger for understanding the spin history of the Earth, which is what he's going to talk about today. Yeah, thank you for the invitation to talk. And uh, this is the first time I've done one of these. I hope it goes smoothly. Uh, I've already had a lot of technical help from Mike and Mike. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I do want to talk about the spin history of the Earth. And I got interested in this problem several years ago when a postdoctoral fellow, Jeremy Kant, came to CETA. And uh, the question arose as to, you know, what were the, people are interested in habitable planets around other stars. And uh, there's been a lot of focus in the last, you know, almost decade now on, on lower mass stars in the sun because they're more numerous than the sun. Uh, and we've discovered a lot of planets around such stars. And to be in the habitable zone usually means the definition is that there should be you could have liquid water on the surface of the planet. So you gotta be fairly close to a, a lower mass star. But if you're close to a star, then the star tends to exert a strong tide on the planet. And therefore it'll, uh, it's thought, cause the spin of the planet to be locked so that the day has the same length as the year. So the planet always shows the same face towards the star, the same way the moon does to the earth. The moon always shows us the same face. And we believe that was because of tidal dissipation in the moon over the history of the earth. And uh, we realize that there are other effects that can cause the spin of a planet to change, one of which is thermal tides. And that's going to be the main focus of my talk today. But I'll start off, I'll show you uh, uh, what I should just explain quickly in the picture here on the left side. These are thin sections of rocks. These particular rocks are about a billion years old. And uh, you can see these layers. And the, the geologists have demonstrated, in fact, that these are tidal deposits in uh, marine estuaries where, where a river comes into the ocean. And then the tides cause the flow from the river to ebb and flow. And that changes the type of soil that's laid down. I'll, I'll describe this in more detail later. So that's what this is. And on the right side, it's just showing from data like the plot, like the figure on the left, the inference of the length of the day. Okay. Uh, so let me go ahead and then outline, oops, that didn't work. There we go. Um, what I'm going to talk about. So I'll start off. So the, the goal here, as I was just saying, is to try to understand what sets the length of day on a planet. If it's just tides, like the ocean tides on the earth, then planets that are slightly closer to the earth, to, the, to their host star than, than the earth is to the sun, then you'd expect them to be gravitationally totally locked. That's not quite true because Venus is closer to the sun than we are, and it's not quite tidally locked, although it's nearly so. And Mercury is also not quite tidally locked, but it's in a three to two spin orbit resonance. So you'd expect that kind of behavior if you don't have an atmosphere. But if you have an atmosphere, I'm going to argue that in fact you can change the spins of the planets. And I'm going to try to show that that actually happened in our case. The Earth's spin has been controlled actually by the thermal tides, not by ocean tides over most of the Earth's history. But to tell you about this, I'm going to first describe gravitational tides. You know, 50 or 100 years ago, a lot of astronomers would have known all about this. But I think these days, a lot of people aren't that familiar with these ideas. So I'll describe them. Then I'll talk about thermal tides, uh, which I certainly wasn't familiar with until fairly recently. I don't think too many people are. Uh, then after describing the physics of those two types of tides, I'll talk about data, which is from the geologic record. And that's been a real learning process for me, so that's been really fun. And then I'll use the theory that I described in the first two topics there to compare to the data. And I'll try to argue, as I say, that in fact, the spin history there 
has actually been dominated by thermal tides, not by gravitational tides. Okay. So I'm just gonna start off with a little bit of physics and this really simplified version of things. So the angular momentum in the Earth Moon system has really four components. I'm only gonna talk about three of them. So the biggest component of the angular momentum is the angular momentum of the Earth's orbit, this big L sub Earth here. That's the orbital angular momentum stored in the Earth's orbit around the sun. Okay, and that's dominates by far. Uh, another component is the spin of the Earth, which you think of as the length of the day, okay? Um, and the third one I'm gonna talk about is, is the orbital angular momentum of the moon around the Earth. Now, of course, there's also a spin or, uh, or uh, excuse me, a spin angular momentum for the moon, but because it's tightly locked currently and has been over the, most of the moon's history, that angular momentum is much smaller than the orbital angular momentum of the moon. And the spin orbital angle, sorry, the spin angular momentum of the Earth and the orbital angular momentum of the moon are roughly the same within a factor of two. So I'm going to neglect the much smaller spin angular momentum of the, of the moon. Okay. I should say this is all in, in work by a thesis student, um, Hambo Wu, and then uh, other collaborators here at Toronto, which I showed in the first slide. Okay, so the, these angular momenta, they're changed by torques, and there are three torques in the problem that I consider. One is the main one that people normally think about, which is this, I'm just calling it T here. That's the, the torque on the Earth provided by the moon. Okay, the moon rises, raises tides on the Earth, and then those tides, which I'll describe in a second, uh, are gravitationally attracted to the moon, and that changes the orbital angular momentum of the moon. Now, that orbital angular momentum, which goes into the moon, is coming out of the Earth, so that's why this, this particular T has a minus sign on it, this one doesn't. There's also a solar gravitational torque, T solar here, it's the same way, right? The, if you've been to the beach, you know that the tides aren't always high tide when the moon's overhead. It's often when the sun is overhead. And they're comparable. The lunar and the solar torque are within a factor of five of each other. And the one that's less familiar here is this, the thermal torque, which I'll describe how that works in, in a few minutes. Um, and today, this thermal torque is maybe 10% or 7% of, of, of the lunar torque. And therefore, it's, you know, it's a little bit smaller than the solar torque. But I'm going to argue that in the past, this one was actually quite a bit higher. All right, so that's the simple dynamical system that I'll be solving, but I want to try to explain how you calculate these torques and et cetera. Okay. So I'm going to start off by referring to an old paper by Sir William Thompson, who was known by most people these days as Lord Kelvin. This is before he was a lord. Uh, this paper is from 19, sorry, 1882. And he describes, he's going to talk about the thermodynamic acceleration of the Earth's rotation. He's going to talk about the thermal tides. But he starts out by talking about the normal lunar and solar gravitational tides. And I hadn't actually known this history. It says here, it has long been known, having been first, I believe, pointed out by Kant, and more recently brought to near a very practical conclusion by Delaunay, that the Earth's rotational velocity is diminished by tidal agency in virtue of the imperfect fluidity of the ocean. So Newton, of course, explained why there were tides. And then Immanuel Kant, I actually looked up these papers, you can go find them on the web, um, suggested that in fact, the tide uh, was the bulge of the earth that produced the tide is not actually lined up with the direction of the moon. So here's a picture showing that. This is by Gordon MacDonald. So this is the earth here and the moon. The earth is spinning around in this direction. We're looking down on the North Pole and then it's uh, counterclockwise. Um, the moon is orbiting in the same direction. If there's no dissipation in the Earth, then the tide that the moon raises or is going to be directly in line with the direction between the Earth's center and the, and the lunar center. If there's a little bit of dissipation, that means that the material that is experiencing the gravitational tidal force is going to react to the force on it, but with a, a lag. And that lag in the case of the Earth, since the Earth is spinning more rapidly than the moon is going around, that bulge gets moved forward relative to the Earth-Moon line, and the bulge leads the moon, okay? This is the point that Immanuel Kant realized. And then the moon, in addition, exerts a, a force on these two bulges, okay? But this bulge is closer to the moon than this bulge is, so therefore the force exerted on this bulge is larger than that one. 
And the net result is that there's a torque that the moon is exerting on the Earth. So at first it distorts it from being a sphere, and then it yanks on the distortion. And that distortion acts actually to slow the spin of the Earth. Well, of course, it's removing angular momentum from the Earth. That angular momentum doesn't disappear, it goes into the orbit of the moon. So it accelerates the moon forward in its orbit. And the upshot is two things happen. One is the Earth slows its spin, the length of the day gets longer, and the moon, it absorbs that angular momentum, which because gravity is always backwards, it means that the moon moves slower and, far, and moves farther away from the Earth. And so the moon recedes from the Earth, and the Earth, the length of the day gets longer. So those are the two effects of, of the lunar tide. The solar tide acts more or less in the same way. Just replace the moon over here by the sun, and the same thing happens. There, the angular momentum that the Earth loses goes into the orbit of the Earth around the sun. Okay, so it actually changes the length of the year as opposed to the length of the month. That's a very small change, though, because most of the angular momentum in the system, as I said, by like six orders of magnitude, is in the orbit of the, of the Earth around the sun. So it's very hard to make a noticeable change in that. Okay. So just to show you the formula, here's the simplified expression for the lunar torque, which is ignoring eccentricity, it's ignoring a lot of things, but this gives you the general idea. <coughs> it's proportional to this K2 is telling you something about the rigidity, effective rigidity of the moon. G is Newton's constant, M is the mass of the moon, it comes in as the square of the mass of the moon, the torque. And the reason for that is because the height of the tide is proportional to the mass of the moon. But then the gravitational force is the mass in that bulge times the mass of the moon. So you get the mass squared. And then it goes as the sixth power of the, of the distance between, oh, that should have been the lunar semi-major axis, and the radius of the Earth to the fifth power. And this Q is called a tidal quality factor. It tells you something about the rate of dissipation of the tides. And I've ex explicitly showed here that it's frequency dependent. That's not been measured, but we're pretty sure that that's the case, and that'll make a big difference in what happens. Currently, this tidal key was measured to be about 11. Okay, and that means that the bulge leads the Earth-Moon line by about three degrees. And that was determined quite a long time ago, and then measured very carefully, which I'll show in later slides recently. Okay, so here's a, I said we don't really know what Q is. Here's a particular model if you believe it's frequency dependent, this model is really simple. You take a spherical body like the Earth, you put a thin ocean on it, maybe two, three kilometers deep, and you make it about the size of the Pacific, and then you calculate the normal modes of that ocean. Okay, and you can find there are, of course, many resonances in that, you know, as the water sloshes around due to the tidal forcing. Um, and then you can calculate as a function of frequency what that dissipation rate ought to be. And that's shown here as a function of time back in the past for a particular history of the Earth-Moon system. Okay, and it starts out today, like I say, around 11. And in the past, the tidal quality factor was higher. Now we're talking about the quality factor of a resonator. If you have a high quality, you don't have very much dissipation. If you have a low quality, low Q, you have a lot of dissipation. So in the past, the claim is that the dissipation rate was lower. The quality factor was higher. Okay, that's important because if you take the current quality factor and integrate it backwards in time, <clears throat> the moon hits the earth about a billion years ago, which we know is wrong. And that puzzle was known since the 50s or so. Okay, now the gravitational dissipation rate on the earth was actually measured in the 80s. Here's one example of that. The dissipation is mostly happening in the ocean. That's why people use that ocean model that I mentioned. Um, there is a bit of dissipation in the solid body of the Earth. There is a solid body tide, right? It goes up and down by about six inches uh, twice a day. I'm sure you've noticed that, it's going up and down during the day. Um, this is showing though that most of the dissipation, like 99% of it, happens in the oceans. And a lot of it happens, well, you can see, for example, up here, these red spots up there in Hudson's Bay, there's a lot of dissipation. And there's a fair amount of dissipation in the shallow regions on the continental shelves. There's also, though, a lot of dissipation out here. You can see in the middle of the ocean and along this, that's essentially the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So in these shallow seas, like in the um, Hudson's Bay, that's just 
friction against the bottom. So as the water moves over the bottom of the ocean, there's no features down there. That causes a lot of wave generation and dissipation. That's about 65% of the dissipation in these sort of shallow seas. But there's another 30, 35% in these deep ocean regions. And that's, that was just discovered you know, in the 80s. And what's going on there is the tide moves across the bottom. And in this case, it's the Hawaiian Islands, or in this case, there are mid-ocean ridges, right? As the oceans, I mean, as the continents spread, there you have these mid-ocean ridges that produce new land or new sea, sea floor. Those mountains, as the water goes by, the water moves up the mountains and gets launched off as a gravity wave. And those gravity waves di represent dissipation. Okay, and that's what you're seeing here is the satellite is measuring the rate of the wave energy at the surface as those waves reach the surface of the ocean. Okay, so that is the tidal dissipation mechanism. And that would, that's what the model I was showing you earlier was supposed to capture. Hey, Norm, can you just for, give a brief description of how that's measured? So these are, as it says here, the um, Top Topex Poseidon um, satellites. They're, they're basically measuring the height of the surface of the Earth. And they can measure the height of the ocean to like within a centimeter or so. And when you have waves, it, it changes the height and, and causes some scatter. So that's, what, that's how they measure the wave power, essentially. So that's how the measurement's done. Now, in detail, it's, it's a god-awful complicated, you know, multi-parameter fit. Right. Um, but that's sort of the basic idea. You're just trying to measure the fluctuations in the height of the sea surface over fairly large scales, of course, because it's a satellite, you're measuring it from pretty high up. But, the, but then that has to translate into friction on the bottom. Yeah, it translates into G modes on the bottom. So you're actually launching waves. That by itself isn't really friction, right? It's not like you normally think. It doesn't generate any heat. It just generates a wave going off. But then the wave, as it goes up, it gets to the surface, and then it does dissipate and actually heats up the water. So okay. that's where the dissipation actually occurs, not where it's launched, but up where the wave breaks. I see. But the wave does carry a normal momentum and energy. And so as far as the tides are concerned, you're stealing energy and angular momentum from the bulk flow of the tide, putting it in these little small scale waves. Small scale meaning, you know, miles or tens of miles. But that's much smaller than the, the tidal wave, which is, you know, half or a quarter of the Earth's circumference, a much bigger wave. So it's a mode coupling between a tidal mode and a, and a G mode, if you want to think of it that way. That coupling doesn't involve any dissipation directly. But, the, but the, once you put the energy into the wave, it, it just goes into heat in the ocean. It doesn't, doesn't come back into the tide. So from that point of view, it is a dissipation. Okay. That makes Thanks. Sense. Yeah. So Norm, I have a question about your previous plot on uh, evolution of Q, uh, this, this one. one. Yeah. So what's responsible for this evolution? So basically, this is just driven by the changes. So, so as I said, this is for a particular history of this Earth-Moon system. So in the past, because there was, there's always been dissipation. In the past, the moon was closer to the Earth. Mm -hmm. In fact, we know it was basically formed out of the mantle of the Earth. We know that because of the isotopic and elemental abundances match almost perfectly between the Earth and the Earth's mantle, I should say, and the moon. Um, so when it was really close, the angle momentum was mostly actually in the spin of the Earth, meaning it was really the length of day back here was about eight hours or even shorter. I started all these when the moon was 20 Earth radii away for, because there's some interesting dynamical interactions earlier than that. So originally it was basically rotating during your breakup. So about three and a half hours, something like that. So when it's moving very rapidly, now this model just assumes the Pacific Ocean was there at the time, which clearly it wasn't. But if you have any kind of large scale ocean, the modes in that ocean, if they're roughly the size of the Earth, they're gonna have periods that are more like 12 hours. But the Earth is now spinning at three and a half to four hours. You don't excite any modes in the ocean. So therefore, you don't have these large scale flows that are as, as vigorous as they are today. So that's the basic physical factor of why there was less dissipation. The tides, the moon was closer, so the tides were higher. They had a higher amplitude. But um, the quality factor was also higher. So the dissipation rate was not as high as you think it was. Okay. Now, I should point out, the dissipation rates back here, when you actually calculate the energy dissipated, was much higher energy dissipated, but the quality factor was also higher. So it wasn't as high as you thought it was. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's just going back. Yeah, then, uh, Norm? Yeah. yeah. 
So during Pangaea, then, you know, was the dissipation therefore uh, uh, different? Yeah, it was less, I guess. Well, that's a complicated question. It depends on, so if you just have one major continent, then the ocean effectively is larger. And therefore, the quality factor would also be higher. Because again, um, you, you move the resident periods in the ocean to longer periods or, or um, you know, uh, longer days, but the day hasn't changed its length. So you're off, you're farther off residence. And so, yes, if you have just one big continent, odds are the tidal quality factor is higher. Okay. Okay, thanks. So, okay. Yeah, 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 thanks. Yeah. Okay, so that's all I'm going to tell you about ocean tides. I mean, there's a lot more to be said about this, and I really glossed over things, but it's already been a while, so I better get moving. It's been 20 minutes. Um, so I want to move on to thermal tides. These are, these are tide just refers to bulges that make the Earth non-spherical, large-scale bulges, okay? And in the case of a thermal tide, it's, it's like the lunar tide. There is a, there is a semi-diurnal tide, you know, a, a high tides twice a day. There's also a diurnal tide in the, in the ocean. There's a, I mean, it's, you know, a high tide once a day. They have, the amplitude is largest for the semi-diurnal tide because the, you know, it's a, the Earth is, I mean, the, the distortion on the Earth is a, um, is it a dipole? No, it's a quadrupole. It's a dipole. It's a quadrupole, right? There's two bulges and then two narrow spots. Um, because the, um, the tidal force from the moon is, is you know, it's a P2 term. In the case of the thermal tide, the source of the bulge isn't gravity, the source of the bulge is actually thermal heating of the air, okay? So if you heat up the air, the pressure goes up. If you move the, if you increase the pressure, you expect the air to move away from that point, right? It's gonna produce a vertical, or sorry, horizontal pressure gradient and move, the air will move away from that region. And that is the origin of the thermal tide. The sunlight heats the air, the air tries to move out of the way, the pressure on the ground, though, is kind of runs backwards, right? The pressure on the ground is just the integrated weight of all the air above you. So if you increase the temperature of the air, that creates a pressure gradient away from that point. Okay, you would think that's a high pressure region because you increase the temperature. But in fact, you, since you move the air out of the way, the integrated weight goes down. And so underneath this hot spot, you actually have a decrease in the pressure. So if the hot spot is at noon, you get a minimum in the barometric pressure at noon, and you get a maximum at morning and evening, okay, for a semi-diurnal tide. There's also a diurnal tide, but that doesn't affect the spin very much. Well, this plot here um, is showing the barometric pressure in what was then called Bat Batavia, it's actually now called Jakarta. And you can see here, this is in millimeters of mercury, 760 millimeters of mercury, right, the one, atmospheric pressure on one bar is around 760 millimeters of mercury. And you can see it's going up and down by about a millimeter of mercury or a little more, twice a day. So this is, you know, one day to the next. So there's a peak there, that's a peak, and there's the second peak. So that's a semi-diurnal tide. There's also in here a signal of a diurnal tide, but it's harder to see by eye. Now, Batavia, Jakarta is near the equator. This other plot shows a barometer at the same time. Um, in Potsdam, in Germany, much farther away from the equator. And there you can't see any signature of a semi-diagonal tide. You see this huge signature there, and that's what's called weather, right? Since we live in Canada, we know all about that. Now what this is illustrating is two things. One, if you're trying to find the thermal tide, you don't look in Northern Europe. And the first person to look for this was actually Laplace. He realized it should be there and he looked for it and couldn't see it because he saw things like this in Paris. But at the same time, the Brits, namely Lord Kelvin, had already seen this because they were floating boats all over the planet at the time and they all had barometers on them and they could see this all the time. So I'll come back to that, okay? But it's also showing you that in fact, the reason, one of the reasons you don't see it up here is because the, this thermal tide is actually constrained very close to the equator, all right? I won't go into that in any detail, but um, there's a good reason for that, all right? So going back to that first paper that I showed you, this is Lord Kelvin again. And here's his plot of the lunar tide and the solar thermal tide. So in this case, S here is the sun. Here's the Earth spinning around. And he shows a bulge in the atmosphere here and here, which is produced by the thermal tide. 
And this 30 degrees here, he got from observations, okay? And the height of it, he also knew, it was about, I'll see in a second, um, eight millimeters of mercury, sorry, 0.8 millimeters of mercury. And what he's arguing here in the paper is that this bulge, because the Earth is spinning in this direction and the sun's up here, this bulge is gonna to try to accelerate the spin of the Earth, the opposite to the lunar tiger, which tends to decelerate, okay? So here's his data, which was originally collected from a bunch of boats, as I said, by Robert Strong, okay? And so I'll just point out quickly this table here. This is Singapore, et cetera. Uh, Batavia's in here, down here, okay? But this is increasing latitude down to this point. And the semi-diurnal tide is here, measured in inches of mercury. So 0 0.038, 0 0.04, 0 0.04. But as you get farther and farther from the equator, 0 0.02, 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.01, 0 0.006, 0 0.006. And then, you know, 0 0.003, et cetera. So that's showing you that the, that the amplitude of this mode is decreasing rapidly as you increase the latitude. Uh, and then it jumps back up to Batavia because for some reason he put that down in the table down there. All right. So that says that there is this very strong semi-diurnal tide. And as he says here, I love this, or getting quit of the intolerable British inch, the, it goes like roughly cosine squared, the latitude times um, eight millimeters of mercury, okay? So as he says here, uh, for every centimeter higher, of higher or lower mercury in the barometer, there's more or less massive error with the locality to the extent of 14 grams over every square centimeter. So it's not a centimeter, it's only millimeters. So it's, it's only 1.4 grams. And then he says, thus the second diamond with this angle of 30 degrees, corresponding to the C2 of 60 in this table, represents the state of things as regards the quantity of air. Okay? And then he just does a simple calculation where he takes a, you know, that kind of a quadrupole and calculates the couple to the sun and finds out that the Earth should be accelerating. And he, and he gets that the thermal tide, as he measures it, is about one-tenth or one-fifteenth of the lunar tide, which is, in fact, more or less correct, okay? All right, so now I'm gonna start moving to modern-day things. You can actually calculate this semi-diurnal or the, or the diurnal tide using a global circulation model or a global climate model. Now, nobody, as far as we could tell, had really sort of tried to do it this way and compare the coupling. But here's one where it's using a model known as LMDZ, written primarily by um, Jean Forget, Forget in France and his student, Jeremy Lacan, who was the postdoc I mentioned earlier. And this shows the prediction of that model for the semi-diurnal tide, the amplitude. So these bright spots here correspond to about a millimeter of mercury. And you know it falls off rapidly as you go away from the equator. And these bright spots are near large continents, okay? And you can compare that to data. Now, let me first of all point out, nobody who builds these GCMs was paying any attention to the thermal tide. So this is a real prediction of the model, okay? Now, on the other hand, they also damn well better get it right because we're talking about perturbations of one millimeter of mercury out of 700, which tells you this should be very linear. And if your model can't get a linear calculation right, then there's something really wrong. But the answer is, in fact, it does quite well. So this is just showing both the semi-diurnal and the diurnal tide. The diurnal tide is not as strong, and that is understood, even though nom nominally you would think this, most of the forcing is at 24 hours, not at 12, but not by a lot. And here's data down here of the amplitude. Probably you can't read this on your screen, but these numbers go up to 120. So that's 1.2 millimeters of mercury. And there's a spot right over there over South America, and there's one here over the eastern edge of Africa going into the Indian Ocean. This spot is not quite in the same location as the observed spot. <coughs> the observed spot's more over the Amazon rather than over the west coast. But here, this hot spot is pretty much where you see it in the Indian Ocean. And the amplitude's bang on. The phases are as well. So the, the models do actually capture this aspect of reality. Okay. Now, the next thing I need to tell you is <clears throat> that's today when we have a spin period of 24 hours. In the past, we're pretty sure that the spin period was shorter. I'll show you data showing that. And if you calculate the same thermal tide from those same models with different spin periods of the Earth, you can see the pressure variation increases as you go into the past or if you go to shorter day lengths. 
and then it decreases again. And I'm sure you've seen plots like this. We're talking about a linear harmonic oscillator. It's damped because there's damping in the atmosphere and it's driven by the sunlight. So we've got a damp driven harmonic oscillator. If you see something like this, you think, wow, that's a resonance, duh, right? And the resonance is easy to understand, right? You're, you're pushing air around and it's primarily a sound wave. It's actually called a lamb wave, but it's a sound wave, okay? And, if, and you can figure out where the resonance is going to be. You just take the circumference of the earth, right, two pi r, and divide by the sound speed. Because you're just talking about a wave in a box, right? It's like a very straightforward problem. And you get about 22 hours. And that's why there's a resonance. There's this bump here. There is a resonance in the atmosphere with a period of about 22 hours today. Now, I, as I just said, it's basically the circumference of the Earth divided by the sound speed. The circumference of the Earth, we're pretty sure, hasn't changed much. But the sound speed probably did change. It was different in the past. The Earth was probably substantially warmer, on average, in the past than it is today. So the sound speed would have been shorter. And this resonant period would have been moved to a shorter period as a result. All right. So this is one way of showing that in the model. If you just change the flux of the sun, you can change the mean surface temperature and the period just changes beautifully, okay? So this plot here, there's three different things shown here. This is varying the surface gravity. And the point of this is to say, is this wave a, dominated by buoyancy restoring forces? If so, then as you change the surface gravity, this period ought to change, and you see that it doesn't. If the restoring force is primarily pressure, then it depends on the sound speed of the temperature. So if you vary the temperature, you ought to see the resonant period change, and sure enough, you do. Okay, so that's demonstrating what I said, which is that this is primarily a sound wave. Okay. And it's subject to resonance effects. Now the width or the peak of this is a reflection of the quality factor of the atmosphere, right? So now I'm introducing a new quality factor, that of the atmosphere, not of the resonant response of the ocean. So just to keep that clear. And that there's no really good theory for. There's one calculation that says it ought to be around 30. These models that I'm showing here suggest it's more like 15, but I don't think they're converged numerically. GCMs tend to run a very low spatial resolution. And we tried to push it as far as we can and the quality factor does increase as we increase the resolution, but we haven't seen it yet. So now I want to take just a few minutes. Let's see, I've got another 20 minutes to go or a little less. I thought this is a physics as well as astronomy talk, right? So I just thought I'd quickly go through the, the normal mode physics that I talked about. And in particular, I, I kind of like this calculation because I did it myself to see if I could predict what the amplitude should be from the thermal forcing. And the answer is you, can, I, you get within a factor of two of the actual amplitude we see. So, right, we're gonna solve the fluid equations in a spherical body but I'm gonna cheat and I'm gonna ignore a lot of things. I'm gonna ignore, for example, the Coriolis force, the rotation of the Earth. And I'm gonna do really treat the atmosphere as a, you know, infinitely thin atmosphere. This is like Laplace did this in his original tidal theory. So I'm gonna follow those sort of approximations. But I'm gonna solve the fluid equation, right? So I need a momentum, I mean, need a mass conservation. This is momentum conservation and the energy conservation I'll get to in a second. Or the energy equation. Okay, so these terms you should be familiar with. That's the density. This is just saying that if you know mass is conserved, this is the um, velocity of the air in the earth. This is the pressure gradient forces. This is the force of gravity. And this is, I'm just putting in a drag factor. This is going to turn into the quality factor Q. All right. All right. Now the thermal tides, you can just drive them from the first law of thermodynamics, right? DE equals TDS minus PDB, so TDS is DQ I'm calling it here, and using one over rho rather than V. Um, if you uh, run a process at constant volume or constant rho, then you know, DQ, DT just gives you the specific heat at constant volume. Uh, that's gonna be useful later. The, I'm gonna assume that air is a perfect gas and it's a pretty good approximation with five degrees of freedom. So P equals, you know, rho K Boltzmann times the temperature by, by the mean molecular weight. And then CB is, is spy has KB over mu, okay? And the energy is just the specific heat times the temperature. All the, all, the only energy in the gas, because it's, you know, the particles are not interacting, it's just in the kinetic energy of the gas, okay? 
All right, so those are, in, in, they're functions of, of rho and, and q. Um, the momentum and, and the force, uh, the continuity of momentum equations use pressure and density, so I'm gonna to try to eliminate the temperature, okay? So that's straightforward to do. If, if dE is Cb dt, you can use the first law together with the equation of state to, to turn that into a, an equation relating the energy to just variations in the pressure and the density. So we got rid of the temperature. So then I can plug that expression back into the energy equation, okay? And so what I get there is this expression, remember the energy equation, uh, let's see, it's just dE is um, dQ minus P d1 over rho, so I wanna plug that back in. So I'm gonna eliminate dE and I'm gonna put in dP and d rho for it. So now I've got, I'm gonna collect all the dPs on one side over here and the, and the d rho's over here, and dQ is gonna just sit there. And what this dQ, of course, is representing is the sunlight coming in and heating the atmosphere, okay? So that's what dQ is. And we can measure that, so I'll get into that. Okay, so for an ideal gas, we know what Cp is, and you can just plug that into the energy equation, you can, and you get, of course, a gamma out of there. All right? So this is dP dt, just depends on d rho dt, and then, and then the forcing, the thermal forcing. So you can now use the continuity equation and eliminate rho and put in uh, the velocity. Okay, so that's the energy equation. All right, so now at this stage, we've got all three equations that we need. We've got three variables, P, rho, and U, and I'm just gonna linearize, okay? I'm gonna assume that the velocity is dead zero. The pressure and density, they're set by essentially hydrostatic equilibrium, okay? That tells you how the density, how the pressure varies with height, and therefore how the density varies with height because we're using uh, an equation of state. So the momentum and energy equations now look like this dP dt is coupled to dU dx, and dU dt is coupled to dP dx, and then there are two forcing terms. Well, one forcing term and one drag term, I should say. So if you combine them, you get this equation. So not surprisingly, this part looks like a wave equation. This Cs squared is just um, the usual, you know, gamma P naught over, over rho naught. And then this is the, as I said, there are two forcing terms. So it's a damp-driven harmonic oscillator. All right. So as I said, what you need to know to solve this, this on the left-hand side, everybody knows how to solve that. You've all taught physics uh, one, basically, or two ways. Uh, but the driving, you need to know what that is, this Q dot, the rate at which heat's coming in from the sun. Okay, and we need the amount of energy per gram of air. And we really want the semi-diurnal component because that's the one that's gonna produce a torque. So the first estimate you say is, well, you got 1,360 watts per square meter. I tend to do things in CGS. And you want to convert from ergs per square centimeter per second to ergs per second per gram. And the way you do that is just divide by the column of air that you're trying to heat up, okay? And sigma, using hydrostatic equilibrium, it's the integral of rho dz, but that's just one over gdp dz. And so that's just the pressure at the surface divided by the surface gravity, okay? And as I said, this land is confined near the equator. So basically, you can use the flux at the equator because that's where you're driving it. But we only want the semi diurnal components. You have to do a Fourier transform. So that gives you uh, this factor of three over, uh, sorry, two over three pi. That's the amount that goes into the semi diurnal forcing. So this is, that is the expression then for Q dot. Well, not quite for the following reason, right? The atmosphere is transparent. When the sunlight comes through, it doesn't get absorbed. So what fraction of that S naught actually heats the air, okay? So it took me a while to realize what's actually mostly going on, and people have figured this out over the last only 20 or 30 years. The largest fraction of the heating of the atmosphere in the Earth is not from sunlight, it's not from thermal radiation from the ground, which is what I thought it was. It's basically just from the formation of thunderclouds in the tropics. You heat up the ocean, the water vaporizes, that air rises, and as it rises, it cools, and the water condenses out to make clouds. And that latent heat accounts for 26% of the solar flux goes into that latent heat heating the atmosphere. That's the single biggest one. 
There is some fraction directly absorbed in the atmosphere, and there's only a fairly small fraction in thermal radiation. So that's from all the greenhouse gases absorbing things. That's the one that people are worried about fiddling around with when you put carbon dioxide in the air. Most of it's just thunderstorms in the tropics. That was a surprise to me. So here's the plot from a nature geoscience paper, which is kind of fun to look at. This is the sunlight coming in. <coughs> 340 is this 13, 60 I said, divided by um, four because you're averaging over the whole surface of the Earth. About a third of it just gets reflected back out. What actually goes into the atmosphere is these little purple boxes. Atmospheric absorption on the way in. There's the sensible heating from radiation from the ground, 24. And the biggest one is latent heat from thunderclouds. Okay. So that, uh, that's, what caught, that's what causes Q dot. All right. So now you don't have to go through all this. I just put it on here in case people uh, want to see this later. So here's our wave equation again. And we know what Q dot looks like. And you just do the usual thing, you know, A, E to the I, omega T, blah, blah, blah. And if you go through a lot of algebra, sure enough, you see the typical resonant kind of terms. Okay. So the semi diurnal pressure looks like this. So here's all the expressions. This is the, um, that, you know, one third or so of the solar flux that actually gets absorbed in the atmosphere. Then times this, both a cosine term and a sine term. Okay. And it's this term which produces the off, offline bulge. So this is the one we're going to look at. And you can see the usual resonant behavior. If omega equals omega naught, remember omega naught is just uh, the frequency at which, well, it's, it's uh, CS over K, right? The sound speed divided by the circumference of the Earth. Um, if you're at omega naught, this term vanishes, right? That's when you're driving the, the oscillator at resonance, you get no lag or, or uh, either way. But you also get the largest response at omega equals omega naught. Okay. And then the torque is pretty straightforward to work out from that. It shows the same resonant behavior here. Okay. So, so here I'm just plotting this blue line is that analytic expression with my estimate for the size of the, of the pressure. And these blue dots are from a global circulation model. This is calculating the torque as a function of changing the length of day of the, of the Earth. Okay, and it does show the classic resonant behavior. Okay, so to give you a better feeling for the scale, this is the lunar torque today, and this is the thermal torque right here today, quite a bit smaller. But in the past, I'll show you evidence for this, the lunar torque was way down here. And these are two different estimates for the tidal Q of the Earth's atmosphere, the, sorry, the thermal uh, Q of the atmosphere. So in this case, it would never be as large as the lunar torque. In this case, it would roughly equal. So that's a, a parameter that we don't know that well. Okay, so now I'm gonna go back and use that. I've shown you the expression for the solar and the lunar torque. I just showed you the expression for the thermal torque. You can just integrate these things. Okay, but I wanna compare the data. So let me go through what the data looks like quickly, because I only have five minutes, I guess. All right, so first of all, you can look at, I said that the tides would make the moon move away from the Earth. That's been measured. I don't show a plot, but it turns out to be 3.8 centimeters a year with a very small air bar. And that could, that's where you get this tidal Q of 11, 11.5 actually. That's today. <coughs> well, how about the past? Well, you can compare the predicted times of eclipses in the past to the observed times, going back, you know, at least in this case, about 2,000 years, to these Babylonian lunar eclipses. And if the Earth's spin had stayed constant, you'd get this gray curve here, roughly. But the actual observed curve is more like this one. And the reason for that is because in the past, the length of day was shorter than it is today. Okay. And so the, you know, you get these. Uh, changes by you know measurable amounts. Twenty thousand seconds is not a hard measurement to make, right? People can tell you what time of day the eclipse occurred. So that means that the moon has been moving away from the Earth for at least two thousand years. Well, that's not a surprise. Um, one problem with this was is if you take that tidal cue and integrate it backwards, basically um, um, 
if you go back into the past, from today back, you hit the earth, I mean, the moon collides with the earth after about a billion years. So that means that that tidal cue in the ocean can have been constant. All right, is there any evidence of that besides that fact? Well, one is you can go into the geologic record and just try to measure, for example, the length of day or the number of days per month. So here's one way of doing that. So here's a record of tides in Eugene, Oregon, or sorry, in Empire, Oregon, uh, June, July of 1970. And here's a uh, clam, which was in the water at the time and growing. And you can see, you can see these growth patterns here. And what's going on is, you know, as the tides go in and out, the clams are occasionally exposed. They're exposed when these uh, dotted lines are there, <coughs> or these solid lines. And that causes the, these ridges in the clam shell. And they line up beautifully with the, so these tides, you can see they're bigger here, and they're smaller here, and they're bigger, and they're smaller. That's the, um, you know, neap spring tide cycle, the fortnight cycle. Um, and then there's these dips here. Where in one case, it's the tide when the moon is, you know, in the northern hemisphere, and as the earth spins around that, that point in the northern hemisphere is on the other side. There should also be a high tide there, but it's not as strong because, uh, right, the moon is not in the, in the plane of the equator. So that's why you have the different heights per day. So that's why you get, you know, you get a, a dark line, then a, then a less dark line, and a dark line, and a less dark line. So you can see that pattern vary. So, so this is a record, basically of how many days there are in a month, okay? You can do the same thing with tidal deposits directly. These are geologic deposits, not biological ones. And it's the same story. These are tidal deposits. You see they're thick and they're thin. When they're thin, they're very dark. Um, and that's again, a neap tide, sorry, a spring tide, and then a neap tide, and a spring tide, and a neap tide. And these are the semi-diurnal, you know, the high tides twice a day. And so again, this is a record of how many days there are in a month. And this particular one is about a billion years old. Okay, so there were tides a billion years ago, the moon hadn't hit the earth. The number of days per month is not that different than it is today. And then more recently, there's another way of doing this, which is just to looking at geologic deposits. I mean, I'm sure you've all seen road cuts where you see these kinds of patterns. And that's because of variations <coughs> actually in the climate over tens to hundreds of thousands of years. If you have a dry climate, you tend to get one type of deposit. If you have a moist climate, you get a different type. The erosion rates are different. You get more carbon getting deposited into the ocean. These are all, of course, from shallow seas. And that allows you actually to measure both the um, precession rate of the moon, and uh, sorry, of the Earth's orbit, I mean, of its uh, obliquity, and the changes in the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit. So you can measure the, what are you know, known as the Milankovitch cycles with high precision. So I don't, I don't have much time left, so I'm gonna skip over this because I wanna to get to more recent results. But this is a way of measuring the semi-major axis of the moon and the spin period of the Earth, in this case, uh, about 1.2 billion years ago. Okay, so in that paper, they just look at the distance between the Earth and the moon, and they're showing various data. Their new data point is here. There are other types, these are these uh, Tidal deposits I was mentioning, here's another type of uh, tidal deposit. And the point is here, if you take the current rate of <coughs> dissipation in the ocean, this shows that it runs in, the moon when it hits the earth about one and a half billion years ago. This is that ocean model that I showed you earlier. And it actually does a pretty good job. This is actually really a prediction of, you know, matching what the distance between the earth and the moon was back to, you know, say two and a half billion years ago. So that's a pretty big success, I'd say. But this is actually, I titled this variations in the length of the day, but this is just variation in the length of the month, okay? So let me talk about these new results. So you put together all that theory that I showed you and you take the data, which consists of these geologic deposits. So here's a pretty much of a mix, uh, a similar plot to, to this one here. This is the earth moon distance versus millions of years. So this is the lunar semi-major axis in the similar scale to them. On the right, I'm always going to be showing if there's no thermal tide, and on the left, if there is a thermal tide. And what this plot shows is that you can't tell the difference by looking at the orbit of the moon. It doesn't care whether there's a thermal tide or not, because all it cares about is the tidal dissipation of the moon. 
It has a slight effect, not a real big one. Um, okay, but now you can also look at the number of days in the month. Okay. Go to this one. So this is the number of days per month. This is what you get for those title records. So this is all the fairly recent things in the Cambrian. There's that recent point from Myers et al. And here's two points from about three billion years ago. Okay, if there's no thermal tie, this is the, I was doing Monte Carlo, this is the best fit I could get. It's really constrained by this part here. Because there's no thermal tie, the total angular momentum of the Earth and the system stays fixed. And you can't capture these points. If you include a thermal tie, the angular momentum of the Earth and the system does vary. And you can see my Monte Carlo chain hasn't converged very well yet, but here, but it's, it is capturing the thermal tide here, this kink in that number of solar days per month is exactly getting captured into that resonance I, I described, okay? Uh, and here's the number of hours per day. So again, if you don't have any thermal tide, it's, it's hard to get that right. If you do have a thermal tide, you can do a much better job. This is very strongly statistically significant, I should say, right? Many, it's a many signal detection, okay? Here's the total angular momentum, or actually the torques in the two cases. This is with no thermal tide, so the green line here should be dead zero. It's not quite. Um, and here it is when you have a thermal tide. So, so having a thermal tide does actually change the dissipation rate in the ocean tide because you're changing the spin period of the Earth, and that affects the dissipation. But the upshot is that overall it looks pretty similar to that. But there's a big thermal torque, and that actually first removes angular momentum from the Earth-Moon system, and then when you pass through the resonance, it starts to add a lot of angular momentum back in. And that's, when you pass through that resonance, that's what causes this kink right here, okay? All right. So, the conclusions are that both gravitational and thermal tides are readily measured, and currently they have they affect the Earth's spin in, in opposite senses, right? The moon is trying to slow down the spin of the Earth, the thermal tide is trying to spin it up. In the Archean, about, you know, between say four and two and a half billion years ago, the dissipation rate of the lunar gravitational tide was clearly lower. That you can just see from the length of the month. Now, you, you have a really good data point. You know the moon is at least 4.3 billion years old. Okay, so there's actually a good data point, which I wasn't showing on those plots at 4.3 billion years. The moon existed back then. So you know the dissipation rate had to be, the tidal Q, the quality factor had to be much like higher in the past. The associated torque and dissipation rate were lower than you would have thought. At the same time, the thermal tidal torque was larger and it added a significant amount, well significant, it's a few percent of angular momentum to the system, okay? In the Hadean, even earlier, the thermal torque was removing angular momentum from the system because you had not yet gone through the resonant period. And that resulting excess angular momentum is detectable in the geologic record. Okay, and the last thing I want to say about this is that in fact, so I've investigated this for Mars. Currently Mars, with its very thin atmosphere, is actually dominated by, well, you can calculate the, the tidal dissipation from the sun, because we know the tidal cube of Mars pretty well, and the, and the thermal semi-diurnal tide on Mars has been measured, because we have satellites or landers sitting there that has been measured. If you calculate the two torques, they're almost exactly the same. So Mars is currently in an atmospheric resonance, and that's why the length of day on Mars is 24 hours. And it's also, as you can see from this basically, now maybe this one, the reason the, hour is 20, the day is 24 hours long is because we got trapped in this resonance around 18 hours, and we broke out of it maybe a gig a year ago, okay? Had this not happened, if you take that same initial condition, the length of the day today would be about 46 hours. So the reason the day is 24 hours long is because of the thermal tide in our atmosphere. And my claim is that a lot of extrasolar planets will also be dominated by these thermal tides. And their spin periods will be around 24 hours because it's just set by the size of the planet. If you're looking for Earth-sized planets, they're roughly Earth-sized bodies. And if they're in the habitable zone, the temperature is going to be around you know, 10, 15 Kelvin, uh, sorry, Celsius. So, uh, thanks for listening. <laughs> oh, questions? <laughs>
Yeah. Now, I had a question. But you you uh, commented that your Monte Carlo models hadn't yet weren't yet fitting those two earliest points, and I was they wondering. Sorry, they hadn't converged. Is that? But you presumably run a fair number. Is there something that's missing, or something you might add to your model? That's. Do you have any physical reason for why they might not be converging? So I so I think uh, first of all, there, there is a. Once you get caught in this resonance you tend to get stuck there, okay? And so it's been suggested that the ice ages are responsible for knocking the earth out of that resonance. And the way that works is, you know, the sound speed sets the location and frequency space of that resonance. If you have an ice age, the temperature all of a sudden gets colder, okay? The sound speed drops, which means the period of that resonance goes up. So you're sitting here trapped in the resonance, the earth spin, all of a sudden you, you move, the resonance to a much longer period. And now that means the force, the torque actually reverses and it starts to push it to a longer period, right? It's the same way that it was happening in the Hadean here, right? If you're sitting here and somebody moves the resonance on you to the right, effectively you're now sitting over here, the sign of this torque changes and it pushes you the same way the lunar torque is pushing you to move to a longer period, okay? So that's fine, you move over to a longer period and now you set up a new equilibrium where you're sitting here in resonance, but the ice age ends. The ice age ends, this thing shifts way over to the left very, very quickly. And if it shifts far enough, you're stuck over here on this side where the lunar torque is now stronger than the thermal tidal torque. And it's the thermal torque is trying to push you back to the shorter period, but the moon's pushing you to a longer period and the moon wins and you gradually go out this way. Okay, so I haven't put that in these models yet. Yeah, but you're talking about ice ages three billion years ago almost. No, I'm talking about ice ages at the, basically at the start of the Cambrian or a little before. The, I forget the names of them. The Minoan uh, ice age and the Sturtian, something like that, around a gig a year ago. Were those the ones they called snowball earth or is that a- Yeah, that would be a snowball earth type phase. Yeah, that's right. And so there was a, 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 a number of ice ages around a gig a year ago. So that was one suggestion. So. I have not yet put that in these models. The other thing is to get this resonance at this location, the sound speed has to be fairly high, which means the temperature has to be fairly high. Okay. The temperature, the mean temperature now is around 15 or 11 or 12 or something like that. To get this resonance, the mean temperature had to be more like 60. Okay. Now when first people started looking, this is called the Hedean for a reason, <laughs> right? Back at that time, the, there were indications originally that the mean temperature about 4 billion years ago was around 80 Celsius. So that'd be fine. More recent measurements suggest it's lower. So I put in a prior there, which keeps the temperature from getting that high. Now maybe that prior is wrong, right? Maybe the original estimates for the temperature were more or less correct. So that's what this data is hinting at. It's hinting at a much higher temperature in the past than we thought. Now, if you go even farther back, you know, like 4.2 billion years ago. There you know the temperature was much higher because we had a much, we had a, the oceans had been vaporized. You had a lot of water in the air and the pressure in the air was, you know, not one atmosphere, but you, as, as high as 100 atmospheres. And under that case, you really have a very strong greenhouse gas effect. The temperature is very high. So that would also lead to a capture into this resonance back here, you know, like four and a half billion years ago. I have not tried to put that into this model. So, so this is a very crude first attempt at how to do this. So I think that's what's going on. My models don't include enough physics to get a reasonable answer. So yeah, it's, the answer to your question is, yeah, the model's not that good yet. Other questions? Uh, yeah, can I ask something? Uh, Go ahead. Uh, so you mentioned uh, Mars, Norm. Uh, yes. But Venus has a much bigger atmosphere, right? Uh, yes. Yes, so we thought right. it would be clear there. Uh, so is that seen on Venus? So, so, in fact, so this is very counterintuitive. First of all, Mars's atmosphere is 1 100th the mass of Earth's. And you would have thought it would be completely negligible, this torque. But it's not true. The torque is comparable. The thermal torque on Mars is comparable to that on the Earth. Okay? So it's not really the mass of the atmosphere that matters. It's, it's the pressure perturbation from night to day. And as I said, that's actually been measured on Mars. And it's, and it's not that different than it is on the Earth. It's about a millimeter of mercury, a little less. Um, on Venus, it's a different situation, right? Venus has 100 
bar atmosphere, 100 times that of the Earth. The sunlight then is absorbed quite high in that atmosphere, right? In the Earth, you don't absorb much, it basically gets to the ground. But if you go down two or three atmospheres, you basically absorb all the radiation from the sun. So you do have, you will have a thermal tide on Venus. It hasn't been measured yet, but I think in the next set of satellite missions, the claim is that you can do it. Uh, Bruce Bills is pushing for that. But that thermal tide won't actually produce much of a torque. And the reason for that is, you know, imagine this, you're sitting in this ocean of air, like we're at the bottom of the ocean, but in the case of Venus, the, the heat from the sun only reaches down partway into that ocean of air. So you, you make this bulge in that upper layer. What's going to happen to all the air below there? It doesn't know about the temperature changing because the temperature doesn't get down to the ground the fluctuations. But it knows about the pressure. So if you pile up a bunch of material here, which is what's going to produce the torque on, for the star, well, what's going to happen to the air below it? It's going to say, you know, I want to get out of the way. So it's going to hydrostatically adjust and move out of the way. And the pressure down at the surface of Venus won't change at all. Right? right? Because that bulge on the outer layer will just be compensated by a hole in the inner part and a, a compensating bulge at you know, 90 degrees away. And you'll get no net moment. So there won't be any torque from the thermal tide. So having a big atmosphere helps up to a point and then it goes away. So I should say the same thing happens, of course, in the Earth's oceans, right? If you put a bulge over the ocean, we do this all the time, right? We put ships out there and that just pushes the water down. But if you go measure the pressure at the bottom of the ocean under a ship or watch as it goes by, you'll hardly see any change at all because of course the water hydrostatically adjusts, it just moves it out of the way and the rest of the ocean raises up slightly. So you raise the pressure at the bottom of the rest of the ocean by a little bit. And, and the pressure from the ship doesn't show up at the bottom of the ocean underneath the ship. So the th same thing's happening with these thermal tides. They're compensated in the ocean. So that reduces the strength of the coupling by a certain amount. It turns out it's about only about half. You would have thought it would reduce it by three quarters, but it's not quite. It's about a half. So yeah, Venus doesn't, the thermal tide isn't that effective. And it's sort of surprising People hadn't realized that this hydrostatic correction would work there because it was suggested in the 50s or 60s by Tommy Gold that that explained the slow rotation of Venus. But it hmm. shouldn't affect the rotation of Venus at all, basically. Okay, one more question from Niesh. Niesh. Uh, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, so, Norm, can you explain a little bit about, more about your dissipation model? Ah, uh, you mean in the thermal tides? Yes. Yeah, uh, there is no model. <laughs> um, so the people don't understand what causes the dissipation and it's not understood. So one idea is that, so I, I sort of glossed over when I derived those equations, the, I, I just assumed the atmosphere extended, you know, to infinity and ignored any vertical structure. If you do it more carefully, you, you, you know, you have to take the, those three dimensional equations and you do a separation of variables and you get, of course, three different ordinary differential equations and the solution to the vertical equation gives what are called Huff modes. Um, and those Huff modes tell you that the, that the response to the forcing, you know, it varies with height, right? It's, there's multiple nodes, okay? So what happens then is if you compress the air here, well, above there, the air is not compressed anymore. You compress the stuff so 80 badly, the temperature's gone up. So that air will radiate, right? The air is radiating all the time. So that warmer air will radiate up into the air above it, and it'll heat that air above it, which should be colder because it's been, you know, uh, instead of being compressed, it's being rarefied, rarefied. So you're transferring energy from one part of the wave to the other. So that'll cause a damping in the wave. So that gives you a, a Q of about 30, okay? Now in our GCMs, we measure a Q, which is more like 15. And I had thought that it would be similar to what was going on in the oceans, that as this tide of air, you know, the air is moving horizontally. You, you can calculate it's about 30 centimeters a second, which is a, not a very strong wind. You know, if you go outside 30 centimeters a second, you'll notice it, but not by much. And it's been detected. It's been measured on the, on the surface. Um, as it goes past, say, a mountain, it'll push that air up and it'll launch a gravity wave, the same way it does in the oceans. So I try to do that calculation. So far, I haven't got a satisfactory result. That could also cause a dissipation. Maybe it explains why these global circulation models have a dissipation you know, a Q of 15, uh, but I haven't convinced myself of that yet. So, so there's two different theories, which both give a low, lowish Q, but I don't think, I don't, I'm not sure which one's correct. So, so I guess what I'm wondering is that shouldn't you have like turbulent dissipation? That's 
That was the first thing I thought of, that you would have a turbulent dissipation, but these gravity wave launching ought to be, so, so for example, in the case of the ocean, you might have asked the same question, why don't you have a boundary layer turbulent dissipation? Mm -hmm. um, and the answer is, in the oceans, it really is launching of gravity waves, both in shallow seas and off of the mid-ocean ridges, it's gravity waves, it's bulk motion dissipation, not a turbulent layer dissipation. So the turbulent dissipation layer produces a lower dissipation rate than, than these bulk motion ones do. And I think the same thing's true in the atmosphere. I mean, if you just did it by order of magnitude, it's in the same ballpark. You get like, you know, 15 to 30, depending on how you pick your parameters. But it seems to be these bulk motions rather than turbulence. Okay, thank you. Good. All right, well, um, I think uh, we're, we don't have any virtual pizza coming, unfortunately. Maybe the chair could order some for all of us. <laughs> have it delivered to our houses. I think that's within the department budget, isn't it? Normally, we would continue yeah. chatting with you over pizza, but uh, I don't think it's going to happen today, unfortunately. But uh, That's quite all right. Let's Although, if people have more questions, I'm happy to stay on. Okay. Anybody wants to stay on can, but uh, let's thank the speaker. That was nice, Norm. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>